speaker. <clears throat> Rear Admiral Scott Hebner graduated from West Virginia University in August of 1979 and received his commission from Officer Candidate School in December 1979. He is the son of Master Chief Retired and Mrs. Jack Hebner. Rear Admiral Hebner, Hebner's sea duty assignments include tours on four different ships and as XO on the USS Yorktown and as commanding officer on the USS Sullivan and USS Gettysburg. <coughs> Between sea duty assignments, Rear Admiral Hebner completed shore tours at Naval Recruiting District, St. Louis, <coughs> Missouri, the Chief of Naval Operations Staff as Cruise Missile Section Head, the Bureau of Naval Personnel as a Lieutenant Commander, Assignment Officer, and Branch Head, and on staff for the Secretary of Defense as an assistant for Naval Analysis and Contingency Planning. From 2004 to 2006, he served as Executive Assistant to the Commander, Allied Joint Chiefs Command Naples, U.S. Naval Forces Europe, and as Executive Assistant to the Chief of Naval Operations. Most recently, Rear Admiral Hebner served as Assistant Commander Navy Personnel Command for Career Management. <coughs> Rear Admiral Hebner attended the National Defense University, graduating from the Industrial College of Armed Forces with a Master's Degree of Science in National Research Strategy. Currently serving as the commander of the Carrier Strike Group 7 <coughs> and commander Ronald Reagan Strike Group, please help me welcome Rear Admiral Hebner. Good evening. Thank you, Karen. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take my glasses off here. I can still see everybody. I'm, I'm right at that point where I can't see the script and, uh, and look out at everybody without taking my glasses off. But I'm very honored to be here this evening. And, and really, before I get too far, I want to say a couple things about what I've seen. Uh, the letter from uh, Captain Kloppenberg, uh, it's hard to capture in words what it's like when you receive packages and stuff like that. But I thought the captain did a tremendous job. I've written letters like that. I've been the recipient. My crews have been the recipients of packages like that. Uh, I've been on uh, three deployments from October to March. I know what it's like to be gone during the holidays. And they are like, uh, many of them are very young. Most of them are very young anyway. But they're like young kids when they get these packages. And, and it, they mean an awful lot. And that, and that was a great letter. And also on the commissioning of the Stockdale. I had the opportunity to commission USS Chancellorsville back in the uh, early 90s and the committee the commissioning committee played a huge role in that so for those of you who are taking part in the commissioning of the stockdale that is a, it's a big deal to the sailors and i think it will be a big deal to those who participate long after the event is done so thank you in advance for that but again it's i'm very honored to join you here tonight and address the uh, santa barbara navy league uh, and it's a pleasure to be in the company of so many uh, who support us so well uh, day in and day out. This is my first speaking engagement since taking command of the Ronald Reagan Strike Group and Strike Group 7 uh, in October from Rear Admiral Weisco. And it's also my first <laughs> visit uh, ever to Santa Barbara. I was talking with Karen about that and I had the opportunity to get here early today and uh, spend some time walking around town and, uh, and getting out and walking the pier and it's, it's uh, even more beautiful than I've heard it, it, it would be. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, since this is our first meeting, uh, I, I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking a little bit about myself. I know Karen read the bio, so I won't uh, go over all of that. Uh, she did mention that I'm uh, the son of a Master Chief. Uh, he spent 34 years in the Navy. Um, I surrendered my dependence ID card when I graduated from college and reported to Officer Candidate School. So I grew up in the Navy. <clears throat> and having and I and, and I was raised as a sailor, uh, in, in all regards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and having been in, in wearing the uniform now for almost thirty, it'd be thirty years in May myself. I like to say I've been in the Navy all my life. Uh, I was my parents came out and uh, visited us at Thanksgiving. Uh, their, uh, my father joined the Navy in August, right before Pearl Harbor, and retired in 1975 as I was finishing my junior year in high school. 
and uh, both of my parents, they were visiting at Thanksgiving, and he, we got to talking about our careers and how long I'd been in, and uh, still sharp at 85, he pointed out that um, we've talked about me getting serving as long as he did, 34 years, and he pointed out very astutely that if I didn't get promoted one more time, I wasn't going to make it. <laughs> as a service warfare officer, going to sea obviously is one of my true passions, along with riding my Harley Davidson and cheering for my West Virginia Mountaineers. I've served in seven ships and commanded two, and any officer in command at sea has the job of a lifetime. No offense to the other carrier strike group commanders, but I know I have the best job in the Navy as commander of the Ronald Reagan strike group. It is an honor to say the least, reporting to work every day to a ship that bears the name of one of our nation's greatest leaders. I've always felt strongly that the Navy is about and succeeds because of its sailors. While I still, am going, I still enjoy going to sea personally for all that brings, it's the opportunity of joy and joy of going to sea with 6,000, roughly 5, 6,500 sailors that keeps me motivated and enjoying what I do. Uh, and, and my, my <coughs> the, the only reason I'm still in the Navy today is because I love going to sea and I love going to sea with sailors. The average age in the sailors in our strike group is less than half my age uh, at about 22 years old. I know you met many of these young men and women when the Reagan was here last January. Uh, during their visit. The sailors hail from all 50 states uh, in over 40 countries. You know when you walk around the ships and you see sailors with their heads high, their eyes sparkling, and their faces smiling, you know when you talk to them that you're getting into something special. And I knew that uh, as I was turning over the Ronald Reagan strike group in strike group 7 and getting around the ships and, and getting around the Reagan that I was getting into something special. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, to command them for the last month and a half of deployment and bring the ship and the strike group home. Uh, and, and I feel very fortunate indeed to uh, not only have the Reagan as my flagship, but to command the sailors of the Royal Reagan strike group. When you, when you see sailors like this with their courage, uh, their attitude, their resolve, and their spirit, you, you, you don't have to look any further to know that, uh, that they represent the absolute best uh, of America. I also want to spend a few minutes updating you on what the Reagan and other ships in the strike group have accomplished in the past year. And just to review, I, I know that the USS Ronald Reagan is near and dear to you, uh, but I also want to point out that, uh, that some of the other units in the strike group include Carrier Air Wing 14, the Cruiser Chancellorsville, which I mentioned I had the opportunity to commission and serve on as a, as a brand new lieutenant commander back in the 90s. And it was, it was neat because I took over, and right after I took over, I was able to fly over to the Chancellorsville and be on board for the ship's 19th birthday. <coughs> I, I expect that I get to do something similar next year for the 20th birthday. <laughs> uh, and also, and, and my old CO, I invited him out, uh, and he attended the ship's Christmas party. Uh, also in the, in the group is Destroyer Squadron 7, consisting of the De Aegis Destroyers Decatur, Howard, and Gridley and also of the, the frigate Thatch. The strike group, as you know, departed San Diego on 19 May. What, from what, in, uh, it was about nine days early. Uh, they were they're sent off to, to get in theater in the Western Pacific, to be in theater post-Taiwan elections and to remain on station during the, uh, during the Olympics. So it was nine days early. Uh, and they returned 190 days later. <coughs> it was an extended 10-day uh, deployment, just two days before Thanksgiving. By all accounts, it was a very successful deployment, characterized by operational flexibility and flawless operations across the core capabilities of the nation's maritime strategy. The Ronald Reagan Strike Group executed every tasking and did so exceptionally well. <laughs> Nearly two-thirds of the deployment was spent operating in the Western Pacific, or Westpac, as we like to say. While we trained and remained, remained ready for any contingency, our focus was primarily in Westpac on theater security cooperation, which I like to translate as working with allies, building partnerships, and winning hearts and minds. <coughs> as part of the nation's maritime influence strategy, <laughs> Ronald Reagan and their escorts visited a variety of seven fleet ports, establishing new connections 
and renewing old friendships in nations and a region vital to U.S. interests and security. When visiting these places, it's kind of like being invited over to someone else's home for dinner. Being a good guest and representing the United States with class and professionalism is mission number one. As you saw here in Santa Barbara last year, our sailors are models in conduct and excellent ambassadors for the United States. Our sailors conduct ashore in places like Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Thailand, and Busan, Korea was impeccable. But it was particularly important for the sailors of USS Ronald Reagan to shine during their July port visit to Sasebo, Japan, which immediately preceded the permanent <coughs> forward deployment of USS George Washington to Japan, the first ever nuclear aircraft carrier to be forward deployed to Japan. Your sailors performed superbly and the visit went extremely well, helping to pave the way for the successful arrival of the GW, as she's called. Perhaps the most rewarding part of Reagan's deployment was something very unexpected, a humanitarian <laughs> assistance and disaster response mission in the Philippines. After Typhoon Feng Shen, otherwise called Typhoon Frank, ravaged the Philippines in late June, President Bush ordered the Ronald Reagan strike group to render immediate emergency aid. The sailors of the strike group um, were more than ready, and the ships were on station in the Philippines within 36 hours. At the request of the government of the Philippines, and working alongside their armed forces counterparts, our helicopters and cargo aircraft delivered more than 500,000 pounds of fresh water, rice, and urgently needed medical supplies to the people of Iloilo, the most affected province in the Philippines. Ronald Reagan and our surface ships served the <coughs> island, launched helicopters, and helped deliver relief supplies that provided refueling lily pads to the 14 helicopters that were involved in the relief operation. Our C-2 Greyhound cargo aircraft went ashore every day with the humanitarian assistance team led by two of the senior captains in the strike group. And it also included <coughs> medical experts and engineers that repaired hospital generators in Ilo Ilo. The mission was a complete success and, and earned the personal praise and gratitude of the President of the Philippines, President Arroyo, and she uh, was able to, Commander of the Strike Group at the time, Admiral Weisskopf, was able to meet with her, and she thanked him personally for the Strike Group's efforts. The other third of the deployment was spent on the front lines of the global war on terror in the Fifth Fleet Area of Operations. For almost two months, the ships of Ronald Reagan Strike Group were widely dispersed across the region, in each conducting a vital mission like oil terminal protection, counter piracy, and maritime security. Ronald Reagan and Chancellorsville were in the Gulf of Oman off the coast of Pakistan, directly supporting Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. The ship showed up at a critical time at the height of the insurgency in, Afghan in uh, Afghanistan, and the world was focused on their operations. Reagan, Chancellorsville, and Air Wing 14 were ready on arrival and called upon to drop ordnance in support of ground troops in contact with the enemy <coughs> on day one on the first sortie from the aircraft carrier. In the weeks that followed, Ronald Reagan's air crews and jets watched over our troops from the skies over Afghanistan's southern provinces, <coughs> often responding to calls from coalition troops in contact with enemy forces. All told, our pilots flew nearly 1,000 combat missions, sometimes dropping bombs, sometimes strafing, but more often than not, providing vital cover and a show of force to deter an enemy's attack. The ship and the air wing team performed the mission superbly, providing tremendous support to our ground forces while doing it safely and without collateral damage or civilian loss of life during their time on station. So it was a big year and deployment for Ronald Reagan and the Ronald Reagan Strike Group. Diplomacy, a major humanitarian effort in combat operations in Afghanistan. I'm often asked as the new commander what lies ahead for Ronald Reagan Strike Group. It's tough to say, but right now our focus is readiness. Our crews have just returned from holiday leave this week on Monday and are digging in and performing maintenance on our ships and planes and continuing and starting the training cycle all over again. Our responsibility is be ready to carry out any mission that leadership gives us. 
with my three months as their commander, I am absolutely confident that whatever 2009 brings, these men and women of Ronald Reagan's strike group are more than up to the task. I hope that 2009 also brings a continued strong relationship between this award-winning chapter of the Navy League and the Ronald Reagan strike group, and particularly the USS Ronald Reagan. Your unswerving commitment and loyalty to the sea services, and now the Army, which, uh, and Air Force, which I'm glad to see, even in times of personal and community loss and challenge, is a shining example of patriotism and unselfish support to our troops that every American should emulate. I look forward to working with and getting to know all of you. Thank you again for the time this evening, and thank you for everything you have done and continue to do for the sailors of USS Ronald Reagan and their families. Thank you, Karen. Start, uh, Admiral Heather, by um, thanking you, obviously, for being here. And if that was your first time, right, I can only imagine we're going to hear some really, really great ones when you come back. You have, uh, you're in good company. You're gracing the Diaz in Santa Barbara, along with other great admirals. Uh, one thing I'd just like to point out, there are fewer people in the United States Navy doing this job than there are in space right now, just to give a kind of scope of what does it take to get to this position. I'd also like to point out Admiral Black Maffin was here, uh, Admiral Natter has been here, and another West Virginia Mountaineer became Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Vern Clark was here. We've had the Secretary of the Navy come and visit with us twice. We are never more proud and, and more grateful than when we can have a representative of the strike group that leads the USS Ronald Reagan, obviously. So the question and it is, uh, it's kind of a softball question because the reality is when you get to be a, uh, in a position like this in the number of years you've served, um, we'd like to know from you if you were to give advice perhaps to a son or, or to someone close and young to you, what does it take in the, in the mindset of a young person to aspire to uh, what you have aspired to and, and your opportunity to be here with us today? Okay. I'll give a shot at that. Oh, I think the, uh, what I, I, I spend a lot of time because I love sailors, uh, finding ways that I can sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and, and talk with them about where they're at. Uh, but what I often most talk to them about is, you know, is, is focusing on their goals. I mean, I think uh, you look at the young people in the Navy, you know, I, I think they have to come with the right character, the right integrity. There, there are certain things that, that we can do to, to move people in the right direction, but generally they have to come with the right character and the right upbringing and the, and the right background um, and, and desire to succeed. My, my, my sense is and my experience tells me that everyone that walks onto the deck of a ship or command anywhere in the armed forces, but in the <coughs> end, they want to succeed. And it's my job to help them succeed. And when we talk, I talk to them about you know, setting goals. Um, and I ask them, and, I, and, and Stephanie will tell she was on uh, the USS Gettysburg and maybe before <coughs> pulled her back in here a few years later to be my aide. And I had all the officers and all the sailors fill out little goal cards that they had to carry with them. Handwritten, three short-term, three long-term, professional and personal goals. Personal on one, professional on the other. And I would sit down and talk to them about, you know, where do you want to be? You know, what's long-term for you? I told them for me it's five years. For you it might be 20, but where do you want to be? And whatever is long-term for you, what does it take to get there? and then set your sights. Um, and and I, I talked to him about how challenging the armed forces are, challenging the Navy is, it can be discouraging, it can be frustrating, it can be lonely, even when you're surrounded by hundreds or, in the case of the Reagan, thousands of people, it can still be very lonely, um, that they have to you know, focus on what they want and focus on contributing to the environment that everybody, that, that creates the environment where everybody wants to come to work every day. or. For me, it's look, look forward to coming. For them, it's don't mind coming to work every day. Um, but that's you know my job as a leader to create that environment, but get them uh, believing in some, believing in themselves, believing in their shipmates, and 
and believing in what it is they're trying to do and, and just have them always something out there that they want to reach for. Um, and, and in the end, I know they're not all going to stay. Um, and, and as long as they decide to leave for the right reasons, then I'm generally okay with that. But that's generally what I say. If you want to, if you want to do this in this business and succeed, you have to start earlier, earlier than I did. I just kind of got lucky um, fumbling along, just having fun and working hard. And, uh, but you know, so look at where you're at and look at where you want to be. Uh, keep your nose clean. Uh, it's, it's easy to get in trouble. You know, form your own opinions uh, and then make decisions for yourself. Um, you know, make decisions based on inputs from others, but don't, don't accept other people's opinions for yourself. So. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, does your father give you advice, or do you take it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, take it I take it a lot better than I did when I was 17. <laughs> I can tell you that. I, you know, I'm going to. I have a son, uh, a, a daughter, 26, who never caused me any problems. A son, 24, who uh, just coming around, and, and, and a son, 16, and I, and I look back to. My relationship with my father when I was 16, and, and I, I keep trying to tell my 16-year-old son, trust me, as the next few years go by, I'm going to get smarter and smarter. So <laughs> I will be smarter now. But I, 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 I do um, uh, talk to my father a lot and talk to him about, uh, you know, it's a different Navy than when he served, obviously, and, and uh, something he told me when, I guess I was a young lieutenant that has stuck with me, and, and I mean, this is a business about people. And I always tell officers and say, you know, doesn't mean I expect people to be good at their jobs. I'm expected to be good at my job. I expect anyone who's on a ship that being good at what they do is that's second nature. But this is a business about people, and I tell particularly my young officers that I'm trying to groom for a future that that you can you can think you're the smartest officer on this ship. You may be the smartest officer on this ship, but if you can't engender loyalty and you can't lead sailors. You're, you're not ever going to make it. And and my father once told me, I was telling him something the Navy was doing, and he got all agitated. He's much more mellow at this point, but he, he got very agitated and said, darn it, the Navy's been in the business of managing people for 200 years, and they still can't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> but but that was a long answer to, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> I still confer with my dad on, on things and, and, and listen to what he has to say. One last question. Sister, where uh, is the uh, Ronald Reagan going next? I may have missed that if you mentioned it. <coughs> I did not mention it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with somebody earlier. The uh, it, it used to be a carrier would go and come back, and it would be a year or so in between rotations. But I know that you followed your ship. Um, and if you look at the pattern for the Reagan since 2006. I'll just say that we're on track to maintain that same pattern for 2009. Um, we'll, we'll be gone sooner rather than later, uh, and, and we'll be going back probably to operate in the same general areas that we did on this last deployment, and for a little bit shorter time. You generally do a long deployment and then a what we call a surge, and, and the Reagan is in the, in the cycle now to be one of the surges. <laughs> Sir, she, just as a matter of a point, she generally comes to Santa Barbara before she goes back out again. I, I don't. <laughs> right now, that's not in the she, uh, she only has three underways between now and the time that, uh, because of the maintenance that's required for her. Um, I mean, that, you know, where the CEO, that's the, the CEO's been, that's the interesting part. You know, I kind of go where the Reagan goes. Somebody was asking, we, the strike group commanders used to have buildings and offices that you would operate out of when the ship was at home, and you embarked when the ship went on deployment. They've got rid of those buildings, and now the Reagan is my office. Um, and if the, Ra if the Ronald Reagan goes out to do flight operations for somebody else, not even our air wing, my staff's either got to take leave, go to school, or get underway. And uh, I told them that you know, my plan is to get underway. I don't know how long I'll get to do this, but every time the carrier goes, I'm going to live. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I don't know what's in store, but you know, I, I would be surprised at this point if they were able to uh, squeeze it in on this very short cycle. Just wanted you to know you're always welcome.
So now we are going to call it into this meeting. I would like to give Admiral Pender a thank you book. It is the Navy League history book. Sir, it is a pleasure having you here, and it's an honor to meet you, and we look forward to having you again. So thank you. Everybody, let's go downstairs and have our reception. I believe I need a motion to call this meeting uh, to adjourn. Do I hear one? Yes. Seconded? Second. Oh, it's so moved. So ladies and gentlemen. The Navy League's monthly magazine, Sea Power, provides news and in-depth articles that focus on the important role of the U.S. Sea Services to the defense of our nation. Whether at home or abroad, the Navy League provides support to our men and women of the sea services around the world. Local councils adopt ships and units, providing morale and welfare support and assistance to their crews and their families. Navy League's prestigious awards recognize outstanding individuals for their leadership and accomplishments within the sea services and maritime industry, promoting leadership, professionalism, and morale. Homecoming ceremonies and ship visits are special events organized and sponsored by local councils, as are ship christenings and unit commissionings. With the help of individual and corporate members, the sea services become integrated into the local communities they serve and protect. In addition to providing support today to the men and women serving at home and abroad, the Navy League always looks to the future to today's young people and tomorrow's leaders. Scholarship programs provide financial assistance to the dependents and direct descendants of sea service personnel. And Navy League supported youth programs such as the Naval Sea Cadet Corps and Navy and Marine Corps Junior ROTC give thousands of young people the opportunity to develop leadership skills test their limits, and perhaps prepare for a career in one of the sea services. The need for a strong, vital sea service, recognized by Theodore Roosevelt in 1902, is no less today. The challenges facing our nation have never been greater. More than 100 years later, the Navy League continues to answer the call. Your support makes a difference to our men and women of the sea services who serve today and will serve tomorrow in support of American sea power. As one Secretary of the Navy said, the sun never sets on the Navy League.